Okay, I think I will get started. Thanks everyone for joining. So I hope you're in the right place. We're gonna be chatting today about optimizing the content editor experience, which is one of my favorite topics. And today we're gonna to be kind of going on a scavenger hunt, looking at some different examples from the Drupal space, but also from WordPress and Contentful. Uh, and just to, to get some good ideas for patterns that we can use to make the content editor experience better and how we can innovate in this space. So just as a quick introduction, my name is Suzanne Dergacheva. I co-founded Evolving Web back in 2007 and have been involved in Drupal pretty much ever since uh, in different capacities. And currently I'm the lead of the Promote Drupal initiative. So if you have any ideas about how to uh, work on the, the marketing of the Drupal project, I would love to hear from you. Uh, and you can always reach out to me. Uh, my email is up on the screen, Suzanne at evolvingweb.ca, uh, or I'm Pixelite on the Drupal Slack. So just a quick background about my, my company, Evolving Web. We're a team of about 40 designers and developers up in Montreal, and we work with all kinds of organizations in the Drupal space. And one of my passion projects uh, as part of Evolving Web is I run our training program and that's one of the ways that I really get to see the content editor experience firsthand because I work with a lot of content editors who are working with Drupal for the first time. So just by, by way of introduction to this topic, I know many of us here in the room, uh, we build Drupal websites. Uh, that's why we're here. And as we build websites, we often have this idea of what we're building, um, what we're trying to achieve. And often we're thinking of the end product, like what a website is gonna look like for the end user. So we think that we're building this, this beautiful, this beautiful thing that's gonna look amazing when we're, when we're done. Um, but actually, I think that we should kind of shift that perspective a little bit and think about the fact that what we're actually building is a platform. We're building a platform that content editors use to build their website. Uh, and so what we're actually building is this backend tool and we're giving content editors the tools that they need to create content and communicate and actually do marketing online. Um, and so if we shift that focus, um, then another thing that's gonna change is that we're gonna see content editors as the most important users. So you might see this as a controversial statement, like, oh, really, you think content editors are the most important? Actually, it's, it's, our, it's our end users. Um, but, but if you see your role as creating a platform instead of a website, um, what you need to be doing is enabling those content editors to do their job, and then they're the ones who will be enabled to actually create that great end user experience. And the nice thing about this shift is that if you empower the content editors, then the website isn't just gonna be great the day you launch it, it's actually gonna be this thing that evolves and adapts to the, the changes in the, the needs of that marketing or content uh, editing team. So to get a bit more specific here, um, I think that content editors have a whole range of needs. And I kind of think of this as being a hierarchy of needs. So we need to respond to content editor needs in this order. So the very first thing we need for content editors to even start doing their job is we need to give them an interface that they're comfortable with, something that they can access, something that's accessible to them, and something where they can quickly get started, get oriented, and feel like they can do their job. So just creating that comfortable environment for them. Uh, then on top of that, that's kind of almost step zero, but on top of that, we have to create a publishing workflow. And that can be as simple as the ability to create and edit content, but often it's more than that. It has to also allow content editors to find the content that they want to edit, uh, which can be harder than it sounds if you have thousands of pages of content. Uh, it might involve some kind of approval workflow, translation workflow. So it might actually become a, a much more complicated thing. So having that publishing workflow in place is the next 
step in their hierarchy of needs. Um, then on top of that, these days, content editors more and more are cognizant of the fact that they're trying to create compliant content. So not just a, a page that looks like whatever, but something that actually complies with accessibility guidelines, brand guidelines, um, and that actually has enough SEO juice to get into the hands of the end users. Uh, and so those kind of compliance standards, having that built into their workflow is also really valuable to them. Um, and then on top of that, the icing on the cake, uh, content editors really want flexibility. So content compliance is great, but often content editors have this marketing role where they're actually trying to create content to engage users. They want to have more control over the settings, over the layout, over how media gets used. Um, and so any features we can give them there is going to, that's really going to help them achieve their goal. Um, so I think it's really valuable to go out there and look at what other platforms do in this space, because we can often put the blinders on and really stay in our Drupal world. Um, and so uh, um, a while ago with my, um, with my teammate Annika, who's a UX designer who I work with at Evolving Web, uh, we did a user study comparing some different CMSs and it was a really eye-opening experience. And I've uh, kind of updated that survey uh, recently going through and looking for examples of what systems do really well. So I'll go through these four uh, levels of needs and show you some examples of what I think are good patterns and then also some ideas for um, what we can do in the Drupal space when we're building websites. So first of all, here's one straight off the bat um, that's a Drupal example. Uh, I think that giving content editors this environment where they feel at ease is really important. And one really low hanging fruit thing that you can do is you can use the Claro theme, which is the new Drupal admin theme, because it gives a lot of breathing space. Uh, it's more accessible than I think most content editing interfaces out there. Um, a lot of attention was put into that aspect of the back backend. Uh, and so that's really gonna help your content editors feel comfortable. Um, but, but one other thing that we can do is we can really take care in the back end of Drupal to speak the language of content editors. So Drupal is a tool that's obviously built by developers and often in the past and still today has a developer audience. And so a lot of the language we see in the admin UI is really focused on that developer site builder audience. Um, and what and when I talk to a lot of editors, some of them see WordPress as being an easier platform to use. And I've often wondered why. And I think that the reason is that when you first log into the back end of WordPress, there's a lot of language there that's more uh, content editor focused. And the links for content editors also tend to be prioritized. So I think that that's something that we can think about in how we set up the back end of our sites and how we build um, how we build dashboards for content editors and that kind of thing. And sometimes it's just as simple as the language we use when we're configuring a view uh, or a content type. So next in the hierarchy of needs, we have all the work around publishing workflows. And this is where Drupal really shines because there's so much flexibility that we have over the publishing workflows that we create. But I think it's it's really useful for us to look at Contentful as an example here. And uh, Contentful is a really interesting platform because it's designed to be decoupled. So the, the whole platform is designed for the audience of people who are uh, creating content. Um, all of the UI is built around the admin UI. There is no front end. Um, and so that being said, all, all of the tools for content editors, I think a lot of work has been put into them. Uh, and that includes the interface for finding what content you're going to edit. So this interface here is the con contentful version of the content overview page. And there's a lot of flexibility over the filters you can use to find content. So it's, it's a great search UI that's been built into the back end. 
Um, and if you can't tell from the screenshot, this is you're, you're actually able to choose what you're filtering by. So you can dynamically select what filters and you have available to you every single field that's in the database. Um, so you can just as if you are creating a view or something in, in Drupal, you can really have a lot of fine grained control, control about how you do that filtering. So another aspect of the publishing workflow that content editors really care about is um, the ability to preview content. And so here's an example um, from a responsive preview tool that's built into WordPress. So just the ability to see what your content is going to look like on different types of devices. That UI is built in, which I find really interesting. It's a, it's a simple thing, but I think content editors really appreciate this. And uh, in fact, we can achieve the same thing in Drupal with the responsive theme preview module, which is a module that I found actually um, in experimenting with the Thunder distribution. So one really nice thing about Drupal is all of the distributions that people have put so much energy into. And I think it's a great way of looking for good, good UX patterns for content editors as well. Um, and so, of course, the Drupal version, you have control over which devices you put in that list of options when you're when you're doing the preview. So the, the site builder actually has control over the devices that appear or the screen sizes that appear. When I first looked at Craft CMS, uh, Craft CMS, you know, also has uh, a, a lot of interesting features for content editors. It's it's got a bit of a different um, model than some of the other CMSs out there. But one thing that really stood out to me is that in creating content, you get a side by side preview. So rather than trying to separate the preview out into a separate step or trying to do an in place preview, which is now very popular as a solution, uh, Craft CMS tries to balance this by providing you both. So you see a form, you see what the content is, is how, you know, how it's going to look on the right, um, but you still see the form where the content is structured on the left. And I think this is a nice solution because it allows us to see the structure of the content. So it doesn't hide that structure and the fact that this is a, a, a form that you're filling in from editors. And I think it really makes them feel more like they're in control of what's going on. Um, and of course, you still wanna be able to maybe preview on different types of devices on the right, um, but that's something that I believe is possible as well. And then Contentful, because it's built as a platform that's meant to be decoupled, the preview functionality actually let, lets you integrate with different kinds of front ends. So if you're building um, some kind of React app where the content will actually appear when a user sees it, you can integrate your app with the, the preview functionality. Um, and so of course that brings a lot of value if on that app, you're gonna pull out certain fields or display them in a certain way. The content editor is really gonna appreciate be, being able to preview that. Um, another thing that content editors definitely list as one of the top features that they wanna see uh, is an autosave feature. <laughs> and I think this just comes from the fact that these days we kind of expect everything to autosave. If we're you know, editing a Google Doc or creating an email, we're, we're definitely expecting that if we close that tab, we're going to have our content saved no matter what. Um, and so when things in our CMS don't save automatically, it kind of comes as a surprise. So uh, the, this screenshot comes from Contentful and it creates an auto-saved version of our content. Um, now, one 
interesting thing that that introduces is the fact that now every single time my content gets auto-saved, I have an auto-saved version of that content that's saved in my version history. So just like in Drupal, we have content revisions. These other platforms that auto-save the content uh, end up with a lot of, of versions that we might have to, to go through. So revision management, that kind of leads into revision management, which is another aspect of content uh, editing that can become quite complex. So content editors who have to work in a platform where there's many, many editors working on the same set of content, revision management is extremely important to them. And that's even more so in, in um, government or legal type organizations where the content that you publish, the exact wording is, is very important to track. So one thing that Contentful does that I, I think is really interesting is it allows us to see the revisions not only of the, the content itself, but really easily to see the revisions of all of the content components that live inside of the content. So if you look a little bit more carefully at this screenshot here from Contentful, it's a little bit like the paragraphs module. If you've used this in Drupal, we see the different components that appear on this landing page um, one by one. Here they're called content modules. And we see the, the link at the bottom to add a new one. Um, so again, similar to paragraphs. Um, but what we also see is that for each one, we have the uh, moderation state listed and we can go in and track the revisions of, of each component within the content. So it gives us a lot more visibility on the state of the content, whether or not it's published and then what changes have been made. And the, this is the revisions interface that we see in WordPress. WordPress also has an autosave functionality, so it can end up with a lot of revisions listed here. And because of that, there's an interesting UI feature that's been added to this interface. Uh, it's up at the top, so it's not well labeled. <laughs> I wouldn't say that you would necessarily see it right away, but there's a little slider that you can see at the top in between the previous and next links. And this allows you to kind of slide through time to see the history of the content and how it's changed. And we do get a bit of a sense here that um, the, the content in the content preview that we actually see, um, it's kind of showing us the changes uh, and you can kind of see that with this WordPress content, there are some comments in it around the different elements that have been added through WordPress, which can be kind of one of the drawbacks is that the content is not really so structured. It's stored as markup. Translation can also be something of a pain point for content editors because uh, as soon as you start translating content, you end up with almost double the work, right? If you have two languages, you have to go in and make updates to content in two languages. So you can just imagine how a, a website, um, you know, the amount of work can just start to explode as soon as you introduce other languages into the mix. Um, so for, for many Drupal sites that have multiple languages, there's a very useful translation interface. Uh, there's a translate tab that allows you to manage translations. But for websites in two languages, there's also the possibility of trying to fit the, the editing interface for those languages it, on a single page. And so there's this module that's been developed called Side-by-Side uh, -side Translations, uh, which I think is really uh, an interesting module. I think it's it's something that content editors really respond well to, uh, although it does introduce a whole other layer of complexity when you're trying to to translate um, within within one page. Uh, so I would call this an experimental module, but definitely one that um, improves that translation workflow in a lot of ways. So around workflows, I think there's lots of modules in Drupal that we can consider. Um, the diff module is definitely one that many of us have been using for years and pretty much depend on um, for showing differences between revisions. But some other ones that you might not have tried um, 
uh, I've listed some here, responsive preview I mentioned, autosave form is great for, for adding that autosave uh, feature that editors expect. Um, scheduler, bulk media upload, just to save a lot of time um, in adding images and, and things like that. Um, and then this, the translate side-by-side -side module that I mentioned, I would call this experimental um, just because there's, um, there's a lot of features that you might need to um, think about if you're introducing this kind of change to the translation workflow in Drupal. So give it a try before you commit to it, maybe. All right, so moving on to content compliance. Um, so when I, when I think about content compliance, I think one of the, the main things that makes content compliance easier is if we put the responsibility on the themer, on the um, kind of developers on the project, uh, rather than on the content editors. So as much as possible, we want what the content editors to produce to just be the content and for them not to have to worry so much about the structure or the compliance of what they're creating. But that being said, um, there's a lot of expectation out there that content editors are going to have some kind of WYSIWYG editor. So one way that the um, Contentful project has kind of dealt with this is to provide a markdown editor. And what that does, I think, is it gives a little bit more precision around the markup that's produced. So instead of just a WYSIWYG editor, which sometimes hides some of the, the HTML and um, it makes it a little bit ambiguous whether our, what we're creating is, is compliant or is what we intend, uh, the, I think the markdown editor just gives a little bit more uh, streamlining of this workflow. Now, what Drupal does really well is structured content. And we know that by structuring content and breaking content down into fields, it usually means that it can be more compliant as long as we take care with our templates um, on, the, on the front end side. Um, and so by using things like block types, um, and this, this screenshot's taken from uh, the interface for adding a block through the layout builder, um, by basically by creating fields for all the different components of our block content or our content types, um, we're able to just enforce more content compliance because then we have control over how all these different fields are displayed in the theme. Of course, another aspect of compliance is accessibility. And so I think content editors, as much as we don't want to give them all the burden of of the of the compliance of the accessibility compliance they do have a role to play to be sure and so there's a couple tools that you can use for making sure that content editors are able to create that end user accessibility um, so one tool is site improve and this uh, if you've heard of site improve you know it's a it's a whole content monitoring system so it, it, it's quite extensive and allows you to test for your entire site how um, how much accessibility compliance work you have to do you get kind of a percentage grade um, and so it's great for content governance situations where you really want to have control over the accessibility of the entire site but you also want to give content editors maybe more of the responsibility for their section of the site. Another solution, so, so Site Improve, as you may know, is a paid service. Um, another solution, if you're looking for something a little bit lighter, is this tool here. It's um, Editory Alley, and I'll spell that out for you in a second. Um, and it's a tool that allows you to select what part of the page is the content, and then it gives you this little um, interface for basically reviewing the accessibility of that section of the page. So it flags errors. It allows you to kind of jump to the errors. And if there's no errors, it also kind of gives you that check mark of approval. So it's not going to show you errors that come from other parts of the page, just from the section of the page that's considered content. So this is a nice one to check out. Um, 
And so here are the module suggestions around content compliance. Um, Link it can help avoid broken links um, on your site. Uh, the redirect module, giving editors access to that and training them on it, that's going to also help um, reduce broken links. Meta tag, of course, to make sure that you have proper meta tags and that you have coverage um, so that content appears well on social media platforms and in search results. And then the, these are the two um, modules that I mentioned for accessibility, Site Improve and Editory Alley, which is spelled um, at the end, it's A11Y. <laughs> um, and then uh, the Search and Replace Scanner module is also really popular, especially for content editors who work in, um, in government or in a space where they really want to take find control over the um, the quality of the content <laughs> and when they're managing thousands of documents and they need to make sure that everything is called the right thing. And finally, in terms of flexibility, so we know that these days when we think about content editing, it goes beyond just editing a set of static pages. We want to also be able to enable content editors to create more engaging content. So first of all, from um, Contentful, the model in Contentful for creating more like flexible um, landing page style content, it's similar, like I mentioned earlier, to the paragraphs module where you're able to place different components on the page. You don't see an in-place preview of what that content is going to look like. But what I find interesting here is that as you dig into those layers of components, the interface that's used, it's kind of like a slide in accordion. So if you take a look at your screen right now, you'll see um, in this demo, we're now looking at the interface for adding an asset, so an actual image. And that image has been added inside of a content component, which is called a, a hero image which has also the, the fields for the text, and that's been added inside of a layout page. And so it's very transparent in this UI what that whole structure looks like, and the hierarchy of the content is easy to understand. And that's something that I think it, I really appreciate, and also just the fact that we don't have one giant form. We have these layers that we can dig into. In WordPress, of course, I think many of us now are familiar with the Gutenberg editor, uh, but you might not have had a chance to see it. I know there's another session this week about Gutenberg in particular. Um, so it does, in, it does encourage you to create this kind of storytelling content where you're placing components on the page and you see the page being constructed as you add to it. And the interface is, relatively simple, although I do think that the simplicity, sometimes it does hide a bit of the structure. So as a content editor, you're a little bit more shielded from the actual semantics of the content that you're creating. Um, and then another competitor to Gutenberg, which is also, well, I call it a competitor, another alternative <laughs> in uh, in the um, WordPress ecosystem is a tool called Elementor. And this allows us very, very similar to the layout builder module to select uh, a layout to build up a layout for our page, and then to drag and drop content within that. And what's interesting about Elementor is that it comes with some default element types, um, which, which we would call block types. Um, and then on top of that, you can customize and, and build your own. But the fact that it's kind of an out of the box tool that provides some of these building blocks for us is very interesting. And then the Drupal version of this, we have now Layout Builder in core, which I really encourage you to use. Um, this, this week is now a great time to go and try it out if you've never tried it before. It also allows us to build sections of content and then to place blocks within that section. And of course, since this is Drupal, the real selling point of this is that we are able to define what all of these block types are, how they're structured. 
Uh, and then we're also able to combine content that we're creating on the fly with more dynamic blocks. So aggregated content and other kinds of aggregated content um, and other kind of more dynamic blocks that we're used to using in Drupal. And so just to wrap up, um, some suggestions around building more flexibility into your Drupal site for content editors. We have uh, a couple modules, which I would say are must-have modules for the um, when you're using Layout Builder, Layout Builder restrictions, Layout Builder modal. These are really going to um, help content editors. Uh, restrictions is going to just limit the number of block options they have, and the modal option um, just puts all of those block editing fields into a modal, which can make it a bit easier to understand for, for content editors. The paragraphs library, if you are using the paragraphs module, um, allows editors to reuse their content components. So I find that's something that is one of the top things editors are asking for. And then other modules like focal point, which is used for images um, and providing a more um, you know, allowing content editors to control how images are going to be cropped and used. Uh, I find that that's also something that makes them feel a lot more like they're using a, a, a flexible platform um, and it really helps uh, enable them. So those are all of the suggestions I would have for you today. I hope that was uh, helpful just to get a taste of what's out there in terms of content editor UX. And I would love to hear your ideas um, of other, other modules you know of, other patterns that you've seen, and other aspects of the content editor experience that you think we can improve. So I'll just take a look now at the Q&A tab. So if you do have those questions or ideas, uh, Throw them in the Q&A. OK, we have a question from Andrew. Thoughts on external content ops tools, like gather content um, versus investing in a, like a Drupal solution. So that's that's interesting. So I think I think Andrew's asking about maybe the um, uh, well, I mean, in the past, I've used gather content more for things like doing that initial content entry. So before uh, migration to Drupal, if we're looking to collect a lot of new content from content editors, we'll use something like the gather content module. And I find that things like gather content, I honestly haven't used it in a little while, so this might be out of date, but I found that the content structure was not as flexible as Drupal's. So then when I tried to take content from it and map it to Drupal, um, maybe there had been some metadata on that content missed. Uh, and so on more recent projects, we try to just get the Drupal uh, the Drupal editing interface available to editors, editors well in advance of a project launch, so they have the opportunity to add new content. And then they're also able to get more familiar with the Drupal interface. So to try and avoid that in-between state where they're adding content to another platform. Oh yeah, this is a question that I think I've been asked um, at like every presentation I've given in the last couple of years. Can you use paragraphs with Layout Builder? So I think that there is definitely a use case for, for using both. Um, I think what paragraphs can be really good for is creating structured content that's um, maybe not layout related. So if you have certain fields on your content and you want them to be kind of compound fields that have um, different, different, basically different fields that are grouped together, right, as one component on the page, um, but that don't necessarily control the whole layout of the page and aren't something that need to be like dragged and dropped around the page, then that could be a good use case for paragraphs while still using the layout builder um, flexibility for constructing a layout. 
So for that kind of use case, you could perhaps use them both together. Um, I know that a lot of people are already using paragraphs and I think that it's still a, a great tool. It doesn't give you the same kind of flexibility that Layout Builder does, but you might continue to use it. Um, um, but I do think if you start to try and use both tools for the same thing on the same site, you're definitely going to confuse content editors. They're not going to understand why there's two ways to do the same thing. Um, okay, great question from Rob about previewing. So in the realm of previewing unpublished content um, in the context of different views, you want to see what your what your cont unpublished content is going to look like on the home page or the events page. So one thing that Drupal core actually does now, if you've if you've turned on preview for Drupal 8 or Drupal 9, <laughs> then you'll see that there's something called um, a view mode that you can select when you're previewing the content. And so if you're using a different view mode for those different places where content appears on your site. So if you have like a like a um, what do we call it? <laughs> a summary of the content, a teaser version of the content. That's the word I'm looking for, like a home page teaser. And that's the view mode. Then you would be able to switch between the, previewing the content in that context versus another context. But if you're not using view modes in that way, then it's harder to create those types of targeted previews. And I don't, um, um, I don't know what kind of solution you could use beyond that. I haven't thought about it. Um, oh, do I have any thoughts about Drupal Gutenberg? I honestly have not tried Drupal Gutenberg. I've only, I've only looked at the WordPress Gutenberg option. Um, what I do know is that, uh, from what I understand, it doesn't store the content as structured fields. And so it means that your content might look great on the page that you're creating. But then if you want to go off and use that content in a different way, um, then that could be a, a limitation, right? If you wanted to, your content, for example, to be translated using a certain workflow, or if you wanted to um, take it and feed it into another system or migrate it, um, you might run into challenges. Um, and so I would avoid a solution where you're limited in that way. Depends on the amount of content you're creating and what your use case is, I think. Um, but definitely something that I should look into more. I know I should do my homework on that one. Oh, lots more questions now. Um, Mark, Max says, uh, for the layout builder, it's confusing. Um, the confusing part is that the content is edited in the edit tab, whereas the other content is added through the layout tab. I absolutely think that that's a big, um, a big limitation. And in the users, usability study that I helped run on Layout Builder, that was one of the findings, was that it was confusing even maybe why the edit tab exists. So as currently implemented, how I would use the Layout Builder to create kind of landing page content, flexible content, I would use the edit tab for metadata. And even things like if you want to have a summary of the page that's going to appear in Google search results. So any page, any any field where you want that content to be there and you want it to always be filled in. So like a thumbnail image might be another one that would be helpful to have on that edit tab. But then I do think it is confusing for editors to be taken to, to have to go to a separate tab to control the content that actually appears on the page. So I don't know of a great solution um, now, other than um, there is a, a module which uh, adds a button to take you to that layout tab so that as you're editing the content, you're kind of prompted to go over to that layout tab. Um, but I think having the layout tab kind of more prominently displayed, maybe as you're viewing on the content overview page, having a quick link to it, um, or eventually combining them, um, that could be that could be a good improvement. Uh, Jill is asking that, or she's saying that she's had a lot of requests for a front-end drag-and-drop interface. 
and she's been using geyser for that. I have not used geyser, so I'll add this to my list of things to try out. Um, so a front-end drag-and-drop interface, I do think that the layout builder does a pretty good job of giving you a preview of what your content is going to look like. So it's not uh, it's not like you're on the front end of the site, but you do see how your content is going to appear and you do see it appear in the layout. Um, so if you've tried it, uh, you might see that that's a good enough solution. Um, but I will try out Geyser because I think that that could be that could be like an interesting um, additional solution. So thanks for the tip, Jill. Uh, in Layout Builder, I believe you can use views. Do you know if you can use a contextual filter when calling the view like you could in panels? Yeah, so um, in the Layout Builder interface, you can have settings for your views um, just like you normally would. Um, but another way to integrate with views, and that's just if you're placing like a views block into your layout builder. So the type of settings you might have there would just be around like the number of items that appear in the, in the view within that context. But if you are using the views, um, views reference field module, then this module is going to allow you to create a custom block type that has a views reference field. And then when the editor is filling in that field, then they'll also be able to um, add additional settings. So I think maybe if you use that module, you'll have that flexibility that you need. So for those who don't know what I just was talking about, um, that would be more for if you were trying to display like a list of content a dynamic list of content within a landing page. And you wanted that list to change depending on where you are on the site, or maybe you want it to have uh, a filter added to it based on a certain category or something like that. Um, you can definitely do that. Uh, and I recommend the views reference field. I think I got most of these questions. And I will be sharing the slides. Uh, I will put them into the folder, uh, shared folder. <laughs> so I think that means they're going to end up um, somewhere through the Hopin platform available. I'm not sure exactly where they'll appear, but I will make sure to post them. <laughs> 